everyone. Welcome to our interview series for the James M. Houston Center for Humanity and the Common Good. My name is Jens Zimmermann. I'm director of the center. And our distinguished guests today are, first of all, Professor Bruce Party, who is professor of law at Queen's University in Kingston, Ontario. He's also the executive director of Rights Probe, a law and liberty think tank. And um, Professor Party has written uh, a lot and worked a lot on uh, civil liberties, government encroachment on civil liberties. Uh, he's written in both academic venues and also more popular venues, uh, like newspapers uh, such as the National Post or the Globe and Mail. So welcome, Professor Party. Thank, Thank you for you. being here. Pleasure. Also weighing in on this conversation uh, on social order, law, politics, and government um, is Reverend Dr. Andrew Bennett. He is the Faith Community Program Director at CARDIS, Dr. Bennett earned his PhD in political science in Scotland at the University of Edinburgh, and he is also known to some of us at least as the ambassador for religious freedom, who led the Global Affairs Canada's Office of Religious Freedom from 2013 to 2016. So welcome, Andrew. Thank, Thank you, you both for being here. Um, the occasion is as usual. We had a Professor Party lecture to us yesterday in today's interview. Interview. We wanted to probe some more of these questions around uh, the issues of government, civil liberties, and sort of what's going on in Canada in terms of um, of the Charter of Rights and Freedoms, civil liberties, and um, perhaps a growing authoritarianism and encroachment of government on these liberties. So, Bruce, you've spent much of your career writing about issues of government encroachment on these things. So can you tell us a little bit about how your education and intellectual development took place so it got you to this point of being this you know, long-time critic of these things? Right. Uh, thank you for the question. I, I, think, I think even as a kid uh, in public school, I, I had a suspicion of people who were, had a combination of being silly and also powerful. And... Uh, you know, as a, as a child, there are a lot of adults around you. And you can sort of see as a child who it is that fits into that category. Silly and powerful. Those, those people are to be avoided. And then as, as time goes on, you find out that, 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 there are, that there are people who wield a lot of power in society. And that, that power is sometimes judiciously used and sometimes it's not. And so you get to the point of wondering whether or not the power should exist at all. And so much of the time that I've spent in the law in various areas, at various corners of the law, have been about the degree to which our public authorities are, 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 are over-authorized to exercise their discretion. And this is part of the, the managerial revolution that I think we've been in for quite a long time, de decades and decades. It, it, the, the administrative state is the kind of government that Canadians live within and, and in fact approve of. Most people have a fundamental belief, if they ever think about it at all, that our modern society requires an, a, 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 an expert technocratic bureaucracy in order to run. And that belief uh, governs our society. A lot of people still think, I suppose, that we live in a, a capitalist, sort of market, liberal society. And, you know, to some extent that's true. But, but mostly it's not true. In fact, we live mostly in a managerial society. And, and the idea of management, that is, Hurting people to certain aims and with certain behaviors and so on has become the raison d'etre of government. How should we manage today? What should we require people to do? How are they thinking wrongly? In what way can we fix them? In what way can we save them from their own mistakes? This now seems to be the reason government exists. And, and a, a lot of Canadians accept it. Um, I, I don't. And before we move on to the to more of this, and um, 
you know, we had Regent College, which is a graduate school. Um, and for others who are interested in, in law school, like, are there any texts that you read? Like, what formed your consciousness this way? You know, was it, uh, what, what texts, you know, so what should we give students, in other words, yes. to also become critical thinkers in that two, regard? Two of my favorite books were written by Friedrich Hayek. Okay. Uh, the first is The Road to Serfdom. It's the shorter book and uh, a really great read. And the other one is The Constitution of Liberty. Both, both uh, really, I think, I mean, Hayek, of course, was a, an economist. But frankly, he's a better lawyer than a lot of lawyers are. He thinks very well about the rule of law and, and what, what, how, the, how the law should work if we are to maintain our basic freedoms. And if you, if you look at the template that Hayek describes in those two books and describe it to the way the law actually works now in, in modern day, these things don't line up at all. And although we believe in this country that we live, live under the rule of law, my contention is that it's not the rule of law at all. It's, the, it's rule by law. We have a lot of laws, but, but the, 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 the basic ideas about the rule of law are not being uh, followed. And then one follow-up question, and I'll let, let Andrew weigh in on this. Um, so Hayek evokes to me the, the Austrian School of Economics. Yeah. Um, I was just reading a book by Röpke, um, and the, the emphasis there always seems to be the economy needs to be, needs to be commensurate with the human person. Did, right. that, did that kind of um, anthropological, philosophical um, angle play any role in your formation? That you... Well, not really, no. I, see, so, so there's a real tension between the idea that people should be basically just free to transact. That's the Austrian view. The, the, one of the fundamental ideas in the Austrian School of Economics is that value is subjective. In other words, when two people transact, uh, the, 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 the bargain that they make reflects their relative um, perception of the value of the thing or the good, the service that is being transacted for. And none of the rest of us can know what the value to those individuals are of the thing that they're transacting about. As soon as we move away from that into placing our own values on the way the economy ought to run, we've left that idea. And so my inclination is to say, no, no, people are free to transact as they wish because value is subjective. And whatever they come to is that, and is that is, it's what they come to. And the government really should keep their hands off and let people value what they do. And so, Bruce, you've talked about this distinction between rule of law and rule by law. And just on that last point that you raised, rule of law is really sort of that hands-off, limited government approach, right. whereas rule by law is much more of an imposition by the administrative state that wants to get into every aspect of, of our lives as citizens. So, exactly. so yeah. um, it appears the heart of this matter is this sort of disordered understanding of the role of the administrative state in Canada. Could you speak maybe a little bit more about that and what are some of the key factors um, that have contributed to this disorder within our, our yes. constitution and our governmental system? Because you, you spoke about it quite eloquently last night. Right, sure. So, so many, many centuries ago, we were ruled by kings. England was ruled by kings. And kings can be pretty tyrannical. And then over time, over centuries of struggle and reform, we, we took power away from the king and we gave it to legislatures. And that's great, because legislatures are elected, it's democratic, you have power to the people, except legislatures can be tyrants too. They have sort of an unlimited uh, sovereign right to pass any laws that they wish, and that came to be a problem. And so we took laws away from legislatures and gave it to courts through the American Bill of Rights and then later the Canadian Charter. But now we have a kind of judicial supremacy, and that's not working out really well either. And in fact, it's not actually reflective of the core idea of the rule of law, which I think is separation of powers. So we have these three branches of government, the legislature, the executive branch, who used to be the king, and the courts. And the whole idea was that each of these three branches would do a different job. Legislatures would make the rules, the executive would execute, um, um, implement, enforce, and the courts would apply those rules to particular cases. 
and that all makes sense. The problem is that today we're not doing that. The, these functions have all been mixed together. The legislature, instead of passing rules, I mean, they still do that, but in addition to that, they are delegating rulemaking authority to the executive branch. And all of these agencies and ministries and, and, and directorships and commissions and, and all of the bodies that are part of the administrative branch of government, which is most of them, are now making rules. And the courts, for their part, instead of making sure that the executive branch is limited in what it does to the mandate given by the legislature, courts are deferring to, to these bodies. And so the end result is we have this huge machinery of the administrative state that is doing most of the governing. And, and it's, it's, if I can put it this way, it's, a, it's discretion unleashed. We have all of these bureaucratic bodies not even making coherent regimes of laws, but making decisions on a one-off basis, trying to solve social problems, and we are no longer protected by this, by this separation idea that I think is, is inherent in the, in the rule of law. Yeah, and in terms of the relationship between the legislature and the executive, I think many Canadians, when they understand our system of government, they see a representative democracy. Right. So I send my MP or my MLA to Parliament or to my local provincial legislature, and they're there to represent my interests. They're within a party, mm -hmm. and that party has a particular program to advance, but they're there to sort of represent the interests of, of their constituents. Right. Um, at what point do you think legislators began to either um, ignore that reality and to see themselves merely as uh, people that were there to implement the, the goals of the administrative state? Mm -hmm. And is it a question of parliamentarians in, in Canada either being too tightly whipped within the party structure, or is it a question of them forgetting about what power they actually could have? Oh, I think it's both. I think it's both. I mean, th this has happened over a long period of time. Mm -hmm. And, I mean, I've never been an MP or an MPP, but I would imagine um, that when you arrive for the first time, having been elected, you think that you're going to have the role like you described. Mm -hmm. And then probably the reality of it is the government just carries on, regardless of you know, your role sitting in the chamber and the conversations that you have with your colleagues and the occasional votes that you take. The government no longer is primarily what happens in those, in those elected chambers. It carries on on its own. And it carries on sometimes regardless of, of which party is in power and what the program is. Sure, there are changes on the surface and changes in the rhetoric or in the narrative, but, but most of the power is, is held now by bureaucrats. And in fact, in many respects, um, we think about government in this sense. This is, a, this is actually, I find, very twisted. But, but sometimes people even go so far as to say, you know, politicians shouldn't interfere in the way government operates. It's almost like we have a fourth branch. The fourth branch mm -hmm. is the public service. Mm -hmm. And the public service knows what it's doing because it has the expertise. And if you're just an elected politician, you shouldn't come in and purport to tell those people what to do. And that's upside down. Those people are supposed to be controlled by the people who are elected. And somehow we've wandered away from that idea to something com completely different. It's really the uh, Sir Humphrey Appleby School yeah, of, of Government, where yeah, that's right. I remember I working yeah. for a deputy minister once, and uh, he gave me a little lesson in how government worked. He said, you know, Andrew, ministers come and go. We are always here. That's exactly right. That <laughs> was quite Orwellian. <laughs> Sir Humphrey yeah. himself could have said that. That's right. Yes. That's what people so refer to as the deep state, right? <laughs> yes, right. Yes, so, yes, that's, that's right. Yeah. So it kind of does exist in the mm. sense of, of bureaucrats holding power that mm. are no longer than the rotating... You know, yeah. political figures. Yeah. Yes, sir. I think people object to that term, not because it's not correct, but because it has a negative connotation. Saying it's the deep state, saying is, is suggesting perhaps that really it shouldn't be there or it shouldn't exist in the form that it does. But they're not denying that it exists. They're instead saying you shouldn't call it the deep state because we're the benevolent state. Mm -hmm. We're supposed mm -hmm. to be doing what we're doing, and the idea that we are somehow out of control is outrageous. Yes. Yeah. So let me return to this notion of control. Um, and I don't want to put words in your mouth, so correct me if this is wrong, but uh, I heard you say that Canada is no longer a country where you have freedom of expression. Mm -hmm. 
Can you say more? But yes, I don't want to overstate this. It's not that, that all of your speech is being supervised, but we are becoming a country in which people have to be careful what they say. People are starting to think before they speak in order to stay out of trouble. Now, that doesn't reflect a country in which there is free speech. And in so many respects, the, the, the range of our free speech is being eroded. So just to give you some examples, the Supreme Court uh, has said that comedians, you know, can't tell jokes that disparage the dignity of somebody on a protected ground, if that's the idea that, that the joke is based upon. We have the pronoun problem. We have the government now planning to curate our online content and planning to pass legislation to, to make sure that you don't put misinformation online. And misinformation, of course, is simply information that the government doesn't approve of. And in these, in so many ways, in this country, with a guarantee of free speech in the Constitution, our speech is being curbed and, and, and supervised in all of these various ways. And that, that makes a, for my money, that makes a mockery of the idea that we have a right to free speech. And I mean, all three of us are, you know, have experiences, are active in the academy, in the university. Um, to what extent do you think we're complicit in this? I have a sense, okay, so there's this bureaucratic control, there's this, this, this uh, you know, um, mode of how to speak, uh, sort of imposed to some sense, but I also feel that uh, in the academy, people are quite, I don't know what it is, but we want to comply. Um, you know, there seems to be a certain virtue in then mm -hmm. following these mm -hmm. kind of parameters. Um, and so I was wondering, uh, from your experience, to what extent do you see the university as a sort of um, measure or barometer of what is happening in, in society at large? And are we, are we at fault here? Like, are we perpetuating this instead of, you know, liberating us from this kind of straitjacket that maybe is both put on, but willingly, you know, yes. we enter into it. Oh, I think it is. I, I would say that it's even more than a barometer. It's it in, in some respects, it, you, you could, you could claim that it's one of the sources of the problem. Mm. I mean, there's an old, there's an old line sometimes attributed to Henry Kissinger, but also to other people. So I don't know who exactly said it first, but the line goes, university politics are so vicious precisely because there's so little at stake. Now, that sounds funny because it's true, but then it turns out that it's not true at all, mm -hmm. that the politics starts in the university and has escaped and spread. And so a lot of these impulses that are now current in society began at the university with critical theory and critical race theory and social justice ideology and, and, and wokeism itself. You can trace those ideas, many of them, to the university, and so in these institutions where um, the 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 presumption was that you were there to explore things in as wide and unrestrained way as possible, yeah. turns out to be the opposite, and they are the centers where the the highest degree of control over how and what you say is being is being sometimes not officially um, imposed, uh, sometimes officially imposed, but more often culturally imposed. Like, well, you know, you really shouldn't say that, you know, in a public forum, in a classroom, in a, in a talk, or, or of the like. Do you think there's a certain, uh, I don't know how to put this question, let me start with an example. So I have a lot of friends uh, through my son uh, who are in trades. Right. In that world, yeah. there's much less uh, complicit behavior, if right. you want to put yeah. it like that. Uh, the only way they get it is through social media, really. Right. Um, and so I wonder what it is in the, in the academic educational formation uh, that makes one prone to becoming more complicit with this. Like, is, it, is it a certain sophistication we think we have that, you know, I mean, there must be something to this, so we better uh, implement it. Uh, we are, we're more educated, we're more let's just say it like this, we're more virtuous maybe than like the, the, mm. the rabble and the, the, the crowd, you know. Um, what is it that we're so... Well, it's a very good question. There's probably more than one thing going on. I mean, it, it, there is a degree of sort of intellectual arrogance, if I can put it this way, but there's also the reward structure 
in academic institutions, right? So it's kind of a paradox, right? So you have all these people, some of them with tenure, and the whole idea is that, that they should be from, free from restraint in order to explore uh, un, you know, controversial ideas, all of which is good, except that there's also this, this um, the, the way the academic world operates is that you take on um, a, a, a school of thought. You, you become learned in a, in, a, in a subject area, and you get rewarded for mastering that, that material. And you learn that the reward is in the mastery of the material and following the dictates of that subject matter. And in many ways, I think academics are very conservative in the small c sense. Conservative in the sense that they, they want to stick to the straight and narrow because that's what you know, that's what you're rewarded for, that's what all your colleagues think. And so it's a, it's a kind of, ironically, climate of conformity instead of the reverse. I mean, are the universities a fully lost cause right now in Canada? Uh, I mean, here we are sitting at Regent College at UBC, um, you know, leading medical research uh, university in the country. A uh, lot of good work being done here. A um, lot of good work being done here at Regent that also has to sort of accept a certain bureaucratic structure. Um, St. John Henry Newman said that uh, truth is the object of knowledge of whatever kind. Have universities departed so far from that pursuit? And if they have, what changes would you propose need to happen within the universities in this country to bring us back to not only um, a, more, a more robust expression of, of freedom of speech and freedom of intellectual inquiry and freedom of debate, but just a freedom to pursue what is true? Mm -hmm. uh, what, what needs to happen? Is it, is it so far gone that we can't kind of steer the steer the ship around or do we where are we now right it's now? it's very hard to know the way forward i mean we, we you you have a long process i think of ossification mm -hmm. if i can put it mm -hmm. that way and ossification is very difficult to fix uh you and i'm not speaking now of the of just the universities but of institutions in general that that get into this kind of trouble you it's very difficult to fix it incrementally Mm -hmm. Instead, you sort of have to wipe the plate and start again. And, and, you know, I don't think that's feasible for universities. I'm not suggesting that that should be the, the agenda. But it's also very hard to know how to, how to uh, cleanse the palate, so to mm -hmm. speak. Mm -hmm. um, there are so many, universities have become so large, uh, so influential, so powerful even economically, in terms of their the degree to which they're embedded with governments mm -hmm. and government money mm -hmm. and so on, um, there there are many vested interests mm -hmm. in the university. I not I don't mean just faculty. I don't mean just administration, but all kinds of, of interests. Um, very hard to know where to go to mm -hmm. try to reform them, and so we're left with the possibilities that you'd have to look elsewhere for other kinds of open opportunities yeah, yeah. Right? That, that's what yeah. strikes me is I, I think being maybe part of the solution it can't just be sort of this tabula rasa because as you say that's very hard to do especially yeah. with a big university right. right so do we instead need to create more choice in terms of higher education in the country do we need to establish new institutions uh, i mean I'm, I'm thinking in particular of ralston college down in savannah georgia i know a couple of people that have been involved right. in that right you know a, a college that is based on kind of free intellectual inquiry in the western classical tradition yes uh, the United States has been a, a real growth of, of small Catholic independent universities. Canada, we don't have that same culture, right. but can that be inculcated? Can you, can you have more Trinity Westerns, for example? Can you have more Our Lady Seat of Wisdoms at a small Catholic college in, in the Madawaska Valley in Ontario? Tiny little place, mm -hmm. but it's creating a, a bit of a broader ecosystem of higher education in the country. So is it more a question of not so much wiping the slate, but rather of innovation uh, and coming up with new ideas on how to, uh, you know, bring about you know, good higher education. And you, one would like to think so, mm -hmm. like to hope so. There are some obstacles. Uh, and those obstacles partly come from the fact that the university is very much embedded in this management culture that we've been talking about. And they have the advantages of being embedded. 
So for example, whenever you're going to establish a new university, if that's what you're going to call it, then universities need to be accredited right. to give degrees. And so you have to pass through the thresholds that the that the administrative state requires of you, you, you to meet in order to get that stamp of approval. Um, the universities are also advantaged by the financial support that governments give them. And so if you are going to be a new independent university, not only do you need to get that accreditation, you also need to be able to compete with those established universities for students and be able to bring in enough revenue to cover your expenses in the absence of the funding that are being that's being provided by 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 governments. So this the the things are stacked against you. I'm not saying it's impossible, uh, but but I think if you're going to embark on this kind of project, you need to do so with a with a with with open eyes and a and a clear idea about the hurdles that you're going to need to overcome. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, Jens, you worked at Trinity Western for many years. You know the hurdles that were there yeah. to overcome. Uh, I mean, what's your perspective? Then? Well, I, I mean, I would hope, and this is a, a question then back to Bruce, is um, I could see how if the universities would allow tenure to work, so tenure would mean that you can't be fired unless, mm -hmm. let's say, you murder somebody or you commit some <laughs> kind of a crime like that. So you have other freedom. I mean, that's the whole point of tenure, to be held over so that you have freedom to investigate and research that's critical of whatever is going on. So mm -hmm. these voices. Mm -hmm. um, so if... if if tenure was allowed to work, I could see how within the university you could form, you know, people who are fed up uh, could form new, mm -hmm. let's say, new humanities, a yes. new, more humanistically oriented, classically oriented forms of education. But my question is, is that is that a possibility? And then private places that are not, they could do their own thing, right? Yeah. Uh, even though they're yet accredited, um, they would have even a greater chance. My, my uh, plea at Trinity was always like, remember your roots, Remember where higher education comes from, from the cathedral schools through Christian humanism all the way, you know, into the modern research university. Mm -hmm. And we should be the ones that have the wherewithal to rebirth this thing. Yes. Yeah. Um, but to what extent we become complicit in a whole managerial complex and that people want to go to school because they want a job. Uh, right. And you combine professional schools with academic education and more and more you have professional training. And so people go to university to get a job. Like, that's not helpful either. No, it becomes a vocational institution. Yeah. And even for the humanities, this idea that yeah. I need to get a job with my history degree. Yeah. Um, some of us don't actually get jobs with history degrees, but, but it's this idea that this is the goal. It's not to form the mind. Yeah. It's, not to, it's not to pursue truth. It's not to uncover beauty. It's to get a job. Mm -hmm. And so it seems like we've got a bit of a, like, a really serious catch-22. Yes. And... And I don't think that the solution is simply to insist upon academic freedom or, 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 or tenure. I mean, it, tenure still exists and, and it's not being disregarded. Academic freedom is this idea that the institution shouldn't be able to tell faculty and for that matter students, you know, what to say and what to, what to research, what to explore and what to, what to write. Um, but even those things are not enough for this reason. The universities themselves decide who to hire, and more and more they are deciding to hire people who have a particular perspective on things. So, for example, some institutions are requiring equity, diversity, and, and inclusion statements, as in, you know, what, how does your research promote yeah. the values of? Yeah. And that means you're going to get a very narrow set of new academics. Mm -hmm. And if you provide those academics with academic freedom, as you should, you're still going to get a very narrow view because of the people that you've hired. So this runs all the way through all the processes that the universities do. And it's, it's not enough simply to say, well, we have tenure, so we have to respect tenure. I agree with that, for sure. But that alone won't work because there's, there's selection bias sort of at every step along the way. Yeah. And even in the way that, that students and you mentioned the catch-22, and that's exactly what it is. You know, even the way students now are taught to believe in certain things. So the, so the, you know, the, the graduate students, the PhD students that come up through the system now think predominantly in a certain way, and those are the people who are available to hire as new faculty. And so, as a, as a, again, it's an ossification of, the, of the, the 
kind of explorations that universities are traditionally there to perform. Yeah, and it's a step-by-step -step sort of progression. Yeah. And I, I mean, you know, I don't want to become too specific, but you can tell that we ourselves as faculty are not stopping it at the, at the appropriate time. So I remember how you changed from equity hiring to diversity hiring. Yes. Why? Mm. Right. Equity hiring should be good enough. I mean, I yeah. should have kind of stayed there mm -hmm. um, to, to get the people with the most merit and try to be as diverse as you can, but on that basis. And we had that policy in place, so, so why do you change? Well, see, this is part, but this is part and parcel of uh, critical theory, which I alluded to earlier. This is a, this is a whole, essentially, ideology now. Uh, uh, so if I can put it this way, uh, an anti-Western, anti-Enlightenment uh, agenda, that's what it's become. Critical theory is a an academic idea that began between the first two world wars in Germany and migrated from They're Europe the to the States and and it has all kinds of different branches now, but it's essentially an anti-Western ideology that says that that certain kinds of enlightenment ideas are wrong and must be defeated. And um, this is where identity politics comes from and wokeism comes from. And the equity, diversity, and inclusion imperative is part and parcel of this phenomenon. And, it's, and this all began at the universities, which is why the universities are among the most enthusiastic supporters of these kinds of ideas. And it's no surprise that the universities are among the institutions now that are posting job ads that say, you know, only people with this kind of racial background shall apply. And we don't want these people, and we don't want these people. And you have even started talking about the qualifications. We just don't want these kinds of people as as applicants for this position. That that's that's so far um, distant now from the merit concept that that it's a different kind of academic universe. Yeah. Um, I want to turn to another mm. uh, instance, most recent of censorship of bureaucratic control and so on, uh, the so-called pandemic. Right. right. Of which you've been, you've been very critical of the uh, pandemic measures. Yeah. Um, but you've said an interesting thing. Um, I just want to make sure you get this right. You said uh, that the, I mean, people have different views on this thing. Okay. So I'll just say this. Um, in, in my view, it, it was an unmitigated uh, policy management disaster. Yes. Um, and it was a medical disaster for so many reasons that, that we could spend hours of unfolding. But anybody who looks at the data and what we know now, one might say in retrospect, but I'm not sure that's even quite true. Um, it was an unmitigated disaster. Um, but you've said um, that this seeming mismanagement of the pandemic response by government was not in fact a failure of the administrative straight, state, but its greatest triumph. Yes. Can you explain yes. how that, yes. what so, do you mean by that? So I'm speaking through the eyes of the administrative state itself. Okay through the eyes of the administrative state, this was an unmitigated triumph. Not because the policies worked, but because they managed to exert control to the extent that they did. That was the object. People, uh, uh, you know, assess the policies in terms of their outcomes, which is what you really should do. And I agree with you that the actual policies, the outcomes of the policies were disastrous lockdowns, vaccine mandates, and all the rest. But for the administrative states, that's really beside the point. The point is not the outcomes. The point is, to what degree can we manage people? And they manage people more than they've ever done before in peacetime in Canada. And they reached a new threshold. They've been, we have a new precedent now. And you know, the next time that we have a so-called emergency, there's going to be a precedent. Mm -hmm. And the state is going to say, these are the kinds of things that we do. And that's the triumph. The triumph is they've established a new, a new, a new basis, a new protocol for telling us all what to do using the authority of their expertise. Now, the actual expertise was found wanting. If you watch these people behind the microphones <clears throat> give these rules from day to day, week to week, and everybody could see they didn't make sense and change from Tuesday to Thursday or applied here and not there. But as far as the administrative state is concerned, 
That's entirely beside the point. Mm. And that's the, that's the respect in which it was a triumph. But it was really interesting, the message around this, how it played to people's you know, sense of duty. Mm -hmm. uh, and so compliance was built around this idea of being safe. Yes. And so we have to be safe, and so we have to act safely to protect others. That was the, the overall message, and it shifted with, with the tide. Sure. And while um, you're going, let me throw in neighborly yeah. love. Neighborly love. Neighborly love. Yeah. Christian, That's deeply right. Christian love. Yeah, right. which also got you keep going. distorted. Yes. The Freedom Convoy was this notable exception. Yes. Uh, its organizers are now on trial in Ottawa, mm -hmm. uh, and public opinion of their actions uh, and their motivations remains highly divided. Yes. How did we come to this point of seeing the common good not as common flourishing of, of human beings, of our fellow citizens, and so forth, but as staying safe and maintaining control at all times, not only in the individual, but also at the community and state levels? I mean, Canadians seem to love this. They seem to really like yes. control. Yes. And we've gone from that much vaunted, you know, guide, sort of light motif for Canadian constitutionalism of peace, order, and good government to just order and government. And the good and the peace, I'm not sure about it anymore. So how did this, how did this happen from the perspective of the citizenry? This, this desire, yes, we need to be controlled. We need to be safe. What's happening there? Well, a lot, lots of things, but let's just go back and acknowledge this first. I mean, there's always been an element of deference to authority in the, in the Canadian, you know, formation. I mean, Canada, in a sense, was formed out of the American Revolution, but it's opposite. You know, let's not revolt. Let's stick with the king. Mm -hmm. um, and it's not like, not the Canadians have never... Um, valued independence, I'm not saying that, but but as a culture, mm -hmm. we've been much more inclined to defer to authority than the, the Americans have. Mm -hmm. um, it's also part and parcel a function of this idea of the, of, of, the, of the deity of management. And safety is just one of those things that the managerial state will provide to you. Now, it might not always be in, in the context of a virus, but if you, actually, if you go even to the American experience of the managerial state, a lot of people say that their, their administrative state was essentially um, took off with the New Deal following the Great Depression. And the whole premise of the New Deal was to keep people safe. Not in quite the same way we're talking about now, economically but, but economically, yeah. right? So you, you, you need government help in order to survive. Mm -hmm. And therefore, it makes sense the government should come forward and provide you with all the, these, of these things. And so, in, in many ways, the, the, the pandemic experience has just been an extension, you know, a, a, a multiplication, a, 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 you know, administrative state on steroids kind of experience, but it's not different in kind from the premises that the whole thing sort of began with and has been expanding ever since. Um, I'm not sure if that's a complete answer yeah. to your question, yeah. but... It, Maybe just to sort of move on to, on that last point, sure. um, do you believe that Canadians actually appreciate the degree to which they've embraced the administrative state as the, the sort of ultimate authority in their lives? Um, do they want it to be the ultimate authority in their lives? I'm, I'm a bit skeptical on that um, because I think as we were talking about with the legislature, they still think that they're electing these MPs to go and basically do their bidding. Right. Um, but that's not what's happening. No. So um, what will it take? Will it take more people like yourself, like Jordan Peterson, like others who are kind of trying to pull back the veil on the administrative state mm. and reveal what's actually going on so that Canadians can see, oh, this isn't actually what I thought was happening. I don't want this to happen. I want something else. I want greater freedom. I want you know greater independence. I want less state involvement in my life. Mm -hmm. But then are, on the, the flip side of that, are they willing to accept what that all means if they say less involvement? I, it's a really good way to put that question. There's a real kind of cognitive dissonance for mm -hmm. a lot of people. Mm -hmm. uh, many people um, were w experienced the, the pandemic measures in a very negative way, as, as they should, and as I, as I did. And that experience has made them question the way their government works, mm -hmm. and so be it. And yet, I think if you spoke to a lot of them, they would still 
retain the belief that we still need an administrative state. They're not ready to go quite so far as to say, you know what, I mean, we're going to throw the baby out with the bathwater. And in many respects, this administrative, administrative state idea, this managerial society we have, is, it's, it's like the water in which fish swim. People don't really think about it most of the time. It's just the world that they grow up in. It's what they're used to. And those of us who come forward and say that this is not the way government's supposed to work, we're like the heretics. Like, well, what else is government for yeah. but to solve social problems and to keep us safe? Yeah. I thought that was the whole idea. And yes, I don't approve, they might say, of these pandemic measures. But those were policy mistakes. And next time, the people in charge should make different decisions. Well, for my money, that's not appreciating the nature of the problem. Um, I want to explore just a little bit more um, the relationship between the courts, um, the charter, and people's felt infringement on their charter rights right. during the pandemic. Right. Um, I know you explained this somewhere really well, and that's what I'm driving at. Um, that people felt, well, if if these policies infringe on my rights, uh, I should have recourse to the charter, through the courts that will actually uphold my rights and uh, and and right the wrong, as it were, in some sense, give me satisfaction. But that's not really happening, is it? It has not happened so during COVID. No. Why not? Right. So let me back, and so on. Let like, me back up a step. Yeah. So please. So people think that the charter means a certain thing because that's what the words seem to suggest. Yeah. But if you take a section of the charter, just for example, let's take let's take freedom of expression. So section two B says everybody is guaranteed freedom of expression. And if you look at those nine words, what you can tell immediately is that they don't mean that. And in order to illustrate that, let's just imagine this. So someone comes up to you on the street and says, I've got a knife in my pocket. Give me your wallet or I'll stab you in the heart. Now, that's an assault. It's a crime. It's a, it's a threat of imminent violence. But just words at this point. But it's just words. And if you look at the charter, it says speech is guaranteed. Free speech. And that's all I did. I said words. So how can you criminalize that speech? And the answer is, well, Free speech, of course, is not absolute, and it's not really what it means. Mm. So what does it mean? Well, it means what the court tells us that it means. And that means that, that, the, that the provision itself doesn't govern. The court governs. And the provision is so vague that the court is the one that's filling in all the gaps. And the court is telling us that assault is not protected, but also all kinds of other things are not protected. Right? And so people go and say, well, they can't do that because the charter says so. Well, but the charter says what the court says that it says. Mm -hmm. And on, in, under these circumstances, the court has said it doesn't mean that. And so people are left with the disappointment that these constitutional rights that they thought that they had turn out to not mean what they thought they meant. And right. yet, and yet, they still maintain that the charter means something independent and objective from the decision makers that are applying it and it it really doesn't so one other thing sorry andrew mm -hmm. um the idea of judicial notice within that sort of people trying to get their charter rights through the courts um what was at stake often is the very reasonableness of the lockdown measures let's say mm -hmm. uh and so they would bring you know somebody would take this to court they would bring experts who would say, yeah, those measures don't work, like there there have been protocols in place, and we can show medically that masks don't stem a pandemic, you know, they, they don't stop that, um, and so on and so forth. And at that point, courts would often go in and say, well, we take judicial notice here uh, that the measures actually are uh, correct. Like that's a, a, you said, this is a, not a right use of this uh, right. idea of judicial notice in the courts. Can you explain that just a little bit more? Because sure. I think it's frustrated. A lot of people, how that, because that kind of, you want to bring evidence, yes. which is the basic thing that is in contestation, yes. right? That the measures were wrong, but that evidence just is wiped away. Yes, yes. Well, so this, this, so this judicial notice thing happened most frequently in family law cases where there is a dispute between divorced parents over whether or not a child is to be vaccinated, right? And judicial notice is this idea. So let me back up a step. 
So in any court case, you establish facts with evidence. And the whole idea is that the only evidence that the court is entitled to consider is the evidence inside the courtroom. Like, you can't go out and read the paper. But in these kinds of cases, when there was um, attempts by one party to establish, for example, that the vaccine wasn't tested properly, um, the court, on some occasions, would take judicial notice of the efficacy and safety of the vaccine for adults and children. That's not a proper use of judicial notice. Judicial notice is a way to get around the requirement for evidence, but it's supposed to be used in those circumstances where the matter is uncontentious, right? So the sky is blue. You can take judicial notice that the sky is, that the sky is blue without having to have a witness in the stand to say, I was out this morning, the sky is still blue. But it's not supposed to be applied to those questions that are actually contentious in the case itself. But it's not the only way the courts avoided the evidence that the measures didn't work. I mean, in, there are other ways to do it, and they did those too in the other cases, which was to prefer one set of expert witnesses to others. And the pattern over time was that the courts tended to defer to the expertise of the public authorities to do what they thought best because, after all, they were the authorities. I mean, th there was one court, for example, that, that compared the COVID experience to being at war mm -hmm. and said, you know, <clears throat> in times of war, governments are entitled to expect sacrifices from their people, and therefore, you will do as the government says because that's what the government said. But if the judiciary no longer is a check and balance on the legislative and the executive, then you don't have a democracy. Well, that's... Or that, not, at least not a law. You certainly don't have... Yeah. In, in, in my books, you don't have the rule of law. And yeah. that's what's happening. So yeah. I'm not saying that these three branches always agree completely about everything they don't. They have their own quarrels and arguments. But for the most part, all three branches agree on the necessity of having an administrative state to manage society, especially in moments like the pandemic. Yeah. There have been a number of uh, traditional or national conservatives like Richard Legutko, some others that have said that the natural end of liberalism is a totalitarianism. Right. You're a classical liberal. Right. Um, you're talking, when we're talking about the rule of law, rule by law situation we have here, are we heading towards essentially that reality of kind of a totalitarian state, maybe somewhat benign, mm -hmm. but is that is that where we're heading? And if we are, uh, do we need a new constitutional framework to head that off? Yes, I think that's uh, a great question. There's a big law before uh, you. Yes, members. thank you. <laughs> yes. Yeah, it, it, it is. It is largely benign. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's it's <clears throat> it's claimed to be done for our own good, but that doesn't mean it doesn't have totalitarian aspects to it as well. In some respects, people have said that benign totalitarianism is the most dangerous kind, because it's not apparent what is happening. And those who are committing it are doing it with a good conscience. Mm -hmm. um, so yes, I think we are headed down that route. And I do think it would be a good idea to consider whether or not we need to start again with our constitutional order. I mean, the mistake that I think we made in these centuries of reform that started with taking power away from the king, mm -hmm. the mistake in my books is that we didn't go far enough and didn't say, look, there's, a, there's, our institutions should not actually have the authority to rule over us, but instead, we should be subject to laws only that we actually consent to. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there's some working out to do on that idea as well, but that's a different premise. Right now, we're still, our laws are still based upon the authority of our institutions to, to oversee us. And it might be the legislature, or it might be the courts, or it might be the executive, but it's going to be one of them or a combination thereof. And that doesn't seem to be working because they're taking advantage of that mm -hmm. and setting aside their restraints and doing whatever they think is best. And that has to change. So, Bruce, a uh, sign of a good conversation is always that time flies. And we're at the end of our time. But I do want to give you, I'm sure you get this question. So what's the way out of this mess? If this is the mess we're in, what do you propose we do, or what can people do, in fact? Let's yes. say they, they're no longer willing to play the game. Yes. 
what what is the course of action that you suggest? Well, I, it's very difficult to know an actual path forward what the steps are going to be, but the first step is that Canadians have to come to the conclusion that our present system doesn't work. They have to stop giving credence to this administrative machinery. They have to, um, they have to say what they think. I mean, one of the best moments in recent history was the trucker convo. Mm -hmm. And that was significant, not just because they pro were protesting vaccine mandates, but it was really a, an important moment where ordinary Canadian people said something emphatically that they hadn't really said before, mm -hmm. which is to government, we don't trust you. And that was the threat to the government. Yeah. There was no insurrection. There was no violence. The threat was, the government perceived correctly, I think, that this was a kind of popular uprising against the authority of the state to tell people what to do. Mm -hmm. And I hope that's the beginning of something. Yeah. Andrew, I, I can't resist to give you the last word because you're a political science major, you've had all this political experience, but you're also a servant of the church. Mm -hmm. um, the church in all of this, now you can't expand on this, like we're out of time, but uh, do you have like a word to, to Christians? If, if you agree that we're in this managerial mess, um, what, what is the course of action that Christians should think about? What should the church think about? Well, the, the, the general vocation of the Christian is their baptism. And their baptism calls them and, and us as Christians to certain things. And one of those things is to preach the gospel to all nations. And that takes different forms. And I would say at this time and place in our country, that means to speak truthfully in the public square, to move out from the comfortable pew, to move out from our homes as, as Christians, and to say what we believe. You know, to take a, a page out of, of Bruce's book and say, look, we have to say what we believe. And that it's not just for us as Christians, but to, to paraphrase Alexander Schmemann, Father Alexander Schmemann, it's for the life of the world that we, we act as Christians, and it's for the life of this country. Uh, you know, Christians, you know, believe in this country. Um, and the country is much larger than simply the government or the administrative state. And so we have a duty, I think, as Christians at this time, uh, to speak truthfully, to say what we believe, and to say it in a way that is unequivocating, but also humble and charitable, uh, out of a desire to, to make uh, this country a better place, um, and to speak truthfully. Truth has to, truth does win out. Truth has won. Yes. The victory has been won. Yeah. But we have a duty, uh, not just for ourselves, but for everyone, yeah. to speak uh, that truth into the public square. Yeah. Um, and so as Christians, um, we can't just sit idly by we have to we have to speak and act yeah thank you so much yeah i, I mean i i felt too that uh there was a divorce of of truth from love of truth from mm. neighborly love of truth from solidarity that's right yeah, they have to go together yes. otherwise each one becomes abusive on its own yeah. um thank you both so much for bringing these two dimensions together i mean i think that's really really valuable uh in fact i i i think one saw the the civil and the uh the the religious come together during the trucker protests, mm -hmm. you know, yes. I don't know if you if you guys have experienced this, but uh, even in where I live in Surrey, where the uh, the, the bridges were st stocked with people, yeah. um, and this wasn't a, you know this wasn't an anti-government protest no. in the sense of wanting to subvert the government. No, no. this no. was like we want Canada, right? Mm. You know, it was a really interesting time where this came together. So thank you for. Yeah presenting this to us oh, for yeah. participating thank in this conversation. Yeah, thank you and, uh, My pleasure, thank you. Yeah, yeah. thank you.